<laughs> so great to, to, to see you guys again. Um, it's, it's, um, I want to talk a little bit about, there's, there's a reason we show some of your early work besides the fact that it's awesome. Um, <laughs> and to embarrass you. Yeah, that too. No, but people forget, people forget, you know, before you became the stars of Deep Space Nine, you were working actors. And what that's like before you get a TV series, when you're going from show to show. So, Nana, I want to ask you, what was that like? You know, you're doing all these guest star parts, you're in someone else's show, and then you get a call to come and audition for Star Trek. And at the time, Next Generation was on the air, but it was still his first run syndication, but it's a leading part. And it, you, you know, you think, okay, this other show's going seven years, we're probably gonna go seven years. I'm not gonna have to be auditioning, I'm not gonna have to be doing all this stuff. What, what was that like for you, if you can put yourself back in that mind space? Well, that wasn't the perspective at the day. The perspective was that science fiction, and it was true, it's where actors went to die. And you would never work again, and my manager actually told me, if you take this job, you probably won't work again. I mean, that's it. You are ruining a film career or getting a TV series on a network show. It was syndicated, which again was like going to, you know, the hinterlands. So I was dealing with that, but also dealing with when I got the audition, I called my agent and said, I think you made a mistake. This is a man's role. Uh, Kira is is arguing with the commander and a woman didn't do that back in the 90s unless she was not a leading character and she was evil there was the evil box or the good girl box so that I, so I was dealing with that this was an un, an unusual incredible opportunity to be everything I was because she wasn't human yeah, and that was a time where if you were strong and you stood up for yourself, um, a lot of the male executives said, oh, she's very difficult. You know, she's, she's, you, you don't want to work with her. So, and here you are coming in and playing a very powerful, strong woman that you hadn't really seen on television before. How, when you went into audition, do you remember, like, did you hold back a little bit? I mean, or did you give it 100%? What was the way that you approached because it's political as well as being a great actor because you have to know who you're auditioning for. What, what was that like? To their credit, to the producers and the writers' credit, I did not hold back. I did not make, you know, because there's this moment, remember back in the day where you're like, hi, oh, it's so good to meet you, ha ha ha. And you have to be very nice and, you know, make sure that they're not threatened by you. And then you can do your performance because that helps. They see that you're acting and you won't be difficult on set, as you said. But I didn't do that. I just was Kira the minute I walked in. And, uh, and, I, and they still wanted me. <laughs> so, so when you first met them, you didn't act. I, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. I didn't have to be performatively what they you wanted me to be. You didn't fake the happy thing. I didn't fake being, you know, I'll, I'll make myself small. Which would have been the acting part. Yeah. Right. Because you're not small. N not, no. 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 And I'm glad. It's interesting because as opposed to auditioning for a guest star spot, where maybe it's the casting director and maybe the creators there, the writer, director. You're, when you're up for a series lead, it's the executive producer, sometimes it's the studio, it's a lot of people. So, Terry, what was that like for you? You just come off a show, Paper Dolls, but you're going in, they were having a tough time finding someone for this role, and yet there's all these people and all these expectations, and they don't make it easy to sort of relax. Right. Well, Paper Dolls, I was uh, 19, playing 16, and this was, I was 28, so it was... Playing 280. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 365. Oh, okay. Or eight, whatever. But who's counting? Anyway, um, for me, uh, it was a different thing. I had done the Red Dwarf pilot. They wouldn't see me for Dax because they didn't feel like I was ready for it. Junie Lauer didn't think I was ready for it. And you know what? Um... I probably wasn't. I was feeling very, that kind of thing was very nerve-wracking for me. 
And it was hard for me to build up my confidence because I hadn't worked for a while because of my personal life. Um, but when Red Dwarf didn't go and they couldn't find Dax and I got lucky enough to go in for the audition, uh, I was very nervous and... Um, in fact, I got, I got some of my lines backwards and Rick Berman was like, that's okay, you just take a deep breath and you can start over again. And I did, and I think I said my name wrong. I don't remember how I said Jadzia wrong, but I did. And the girl that, um, I remember her name, but I won't say it, that there was a woman who I auditioned against quite a lot, actually, and she hadn't shown up. And... Uh, so they were going to have another run the next week to do another test. So I asked if I could go back. And for SAG, they can't ask you to come back. But I wanted them to know that even though I was feeling really nervous, I was certainly brave enough to go. If I, if I want the part bad enough, if I can do it twice, you know I'm going to show up to work and want to, I'm ready to play, right? So I went back the second time, and that's when I got it. But it was, it was really scary and overwhelming because it was also a really weirdly empty room with a very long table. It was sort of like reading for spelling, where it was like, you can't see all of the people because they're not in an audience form. They're along a conference table. So it was like a star chamber? Like they were yes, like a star chamber, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, and there were people st stacked behind. But yeah, at the same time, there were too many people to introduce yourself. And it was too important. Uh, I, too, I didn't want to spend any time saying, hi, how are you? I was just completely focused on trying to remember what I wanted to do with the character and my lines and that kind of thing. How difficult is it to prepare for an audition like that? Because you're not solving the murder of the week. You're not playing a fashion model, which is something... Or a fashion cool. model solving the murder of the week. That, that too. Which would be kind of um, great. But you're playing... A woman who has a worm inside of her who used to be a like man. Like a tequila bottle, only different. Who lives on a space station. <laughs> and, 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 That's messed Yes, out. I wore a tequila outfit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you think, how am I going to dress? How am I going to present oh. this role? How do you... How do you prepare for something? Well, like that? unfortunately, or fortunately, I was friends with Marina Sirtis at the time, and she was like, "Oh, Rick Berman likes boobs, and you have to wear something really skin tight." So <laughs> she I wasn't listened. wrong. I, he, no, <laughs> no, I had several fittings for my breasts. Unfortunately, that needed to, yeah. Mm. Unlike but I basically, a <laughs> I basically wore an outfit that looked like I was wearing. A pinup in all black. Okay, I, I've got to interrupt now because I just realized <laughs> something. So, Mark, look, you are a fantastic interviewer. I, I look up to you. I'm intimidated by your skills, but you have missed the obvious question from the top. And now that you're what talking, what is that, about, Ashley? I'd love to know. Now that you're talking I'm, about being I'm terrified. All dressed in black. Look at the two of you. Okay, so you're all in black. You're both wearing these black toques. It's like I have. My question is: Are you planning to rob a bank after? The <laughs> I went to the Galaxy Con store on my way here because I was so freaking cold, I couldn't stand it. I did not have a toque on before. This was not coordinated. This was all. No. Okay. No, I didn't. Well, I could take it off. Now I'm warm enough, but holy cow, it was cold out there. It was wasn't cold it? in there, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad we got to the bottom of that. Yeah, I got to the bottom of that. But you know what? One no. Of these kids is not like the other. But I did. <laughs> plan to rob a bank earlier today. That's earlier. why I dressed oh, okay, she awesome. did. in the morning like this. Yes. She's actually auditioning for the remake of Heat. Okay. <laughs> I was going to go for the the one with um oh gosh, the the older movie, the really cool one with Cary Grant and the Goonies. To catch a thief. To catch yeah. a thief. Definitely not the Goonies. Like raising it up to catch a thief. Okay. He doesn't rob a bank in that. He robs he, jewels. He's, he's John Rowe. He's a jewel thief. Yeah, but that's what Breaks she looks hotel. like. I'm, I'm oh, that's elevating. what he looks like. Okay. Oh, we will return tough. to the panel in a moment. <laughs> okay, I wasn't thinking about the worm. I wasn't thinking about the lifetimes. I was just thinking about looking military. I thought if I focus on, because I didn't have to work on looking young. I was 28, and I was nervous, so I was trying to fight against being nervous. And so thinking about the military 
uh, and I'm, I've always been pretty good about standing up straight. I'm six feet tall, so there's, there's some givens there that made me feel empowered. Um, but yeah, you can't, what do you do with, I have a worm in me. I have a symbiont, so what? I have lifetimes, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means no yet. No one ever thinks right? about the worm. How about, what does the worm feel about all this? See? The worm is a I don't have the worm anymore. Well, I, Somebody else has the worm. Someone else has it. But what's so interesting... I'll get it back. What's so interesting is what you just said. You said you talked to Marina, and the big acting advice she gave you was pad your breasts and look sexy. Exactly. Which brings me to Na and the book that you're writing. And I think that you're looking back 30 years at what you... And not just you, but actor, actresses went through at the time and how that has evolved since then to today. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about this, this book that you're just finishing. Yeah, I talked to so many of the women actors from all the, from over the whole franchise, uh, including a lot of the guest stars from the original, which was, they, they came about, five or six of the women came to my house for lunch, and it was filmed as it should have been, because that was quite something. Um, and from there, I went through to um, Strange New Worlds and interviewed as many women as I could, and also audience members, because what I was looking at is these women who were in Hollywood going through these decades, what was that like? while they were projecting this much wider range and more ability to dream that they gave the audience. There were so many audience members who said, I became a doctor because of Dr. Crusher, or a therapist because of Marina's character, or in the military, or self-acceptance uh, because I'm different, because I contain multitudes. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not sure where I land. Uh, what I certainly saw was the happiest thing for me is the younger actors did not deal with what, didn't know what I was talking about uh, with some of the uh, things that we went through. And their reaction was like, what? No, that would not fly. And I was like, good. Good, that you, because the culture in Hollywood is obviously setting up the situation where you feel entitled to say that. It's not just one person going, no more. You'll be shot down, you're out, because that was what we were told and it was true. But that people are starting to accept the fact that bias and uh, bad treatment of people isn't gonna fly anymore. And, and that's the happy part. I want to take you guys to sort of take us back to what it was like. A lot of people, they've never been on a film set. They don't know what your experience is like. And they don't know how hard it is because it sounds so glamorous and so exciting. And, um, you know, a lot of that was waiting around. But what, when you walk in, into the gates of Paramount and would go to Star Trek Alley, which is what it was called, because you had Next Generation across the street and Deep Space Nine, these big, beautiful sets. What was a day like? Like, take us back to a day in your life back then when you were working, as opposed to at the supermarket because you were off that day. You were on the call sheet, you were there. <laughs> Can I just say, I, even in the sixth season, driving up at 4.45 in the morning, I would still go like, oh my God, I work at Paramount Pictures. Oh my God, I'm working at a movie studio. It was still... Oh yeah. I didn't, you, you're not projecting that it's probably gonna be a 20 hour day. You're, it's just part of, there's this thing about you will do, the show must go on, right? So growing up in the generation, we did a pull up your bootstraps. You're gonna get it together. This is how you handle it. You just squish it down and keep going. Uh, is the perfect mentality for the job we had. And it makes you feel, it made me feel, I'll speak for myself, to be part of a team, um, the camaraderie, that we were all getting through it together. It was our own personal war that we got through together. And that is such a good point because surprisingly <laughs> enough, a lot of it is very militaristic. It was developed, the part of Hollywood we were a part of was developed by 
people who were in the army and they, they kept the language and they kept the, the way it was run, um, a lot of it. So, you know, at like being a good soldier, you know that your purpose is greater than yourself. It's the show, the show must go on. Tough if you don't feel good, you're showing up. You have 104 fever, you're going on because no one else can do it. And this is too expensive of a day. You know, so it, they prop you up. Literally, yeah, you I've up we've been go. propped up to get scenes done. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, there is the moment every single time, as Terry said, you, you go through the gates and the sun's just coming up or it's dark and uh, still. And you go, oh, this is paramount. All the movies I ever watched as a kid. This is I'm part of this. I'm. I'm aware of the ghosts in these buildings, and now mine is in there too. And it's really, uh, it's, it, it's very emotional. And the, it was like a marathon that wouldn't end because a couple of weeks of uh, no less than 16 hour days, 20 hour days, over and over and over again so that it eats into the Saturday morning so that by, you, you, you don't have a chance to physically recover. Um, it's okay if you do that for a month or two or three for a movie, but when you're doing it, you're doing 26 shows, you just, it's like you're mentally impaired slightly and you're just getting through. You have to so hunker there's, down. Yeah, you yeah. Have to hunker Didn't down we and get, get through it? Yeah. Get done like halfway through May and we started at the beginning of July. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then it's a little earlier cuz you got to come back in for fittings, you have to finish up interviews. Yeah. And I wanted to say too the word paramount. Paramount. The most important, the peak of the mountain, right? It was like yeah. There's something about knowing what that word means, too. Even subliminally going through that was like, I don't know. It's so, I, I feel it right now. Mm -hmm. But also there's this. There's, you know, you're up and doing a scene and you're, it, you're fighting Cardassians or whatever it is you're doing and it's active and it's emotional. And then you go back to your trailer and it's this. Yeah. Yeah. For a couple of hours. And then they call you well, and say, okay, you're back. And then you're back and you're doing it. <laughs> so it's like, it's a, a very stop, stop, start kind of life. Yeah. It's not like a theatrical experience where you live the whole thing within two or three hours and you're finished and there's like a button on it for you and you right. can go back to your own life. And it's structured with ritual so you can emotionally get in and out. It's, it's hard to maintain that through a day and uh, come in, especially if it's traumatic, if you're doing tra traumatic scenes. So you kind of, you can, if you're not careful, you can just, and after all, thoughts dropped in your mind, your body believes it, your body is dependent on your mind to tell you what's going on. If you drop traumatic thoughts and you don't go, okay, now I'm somewhere else, it's your body's gonna just stay there. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was wearing. Mm -hmm. Plus on, on film and TV, the, the other crew makes up a huge portion of it. Mm -hmm. And everyone is working these horrific hours. Yeah. And everyone is pushing as hard as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it's all a team thing that they're, everyone is pushing this thing up the hill. Yeah. And, and you accept that responsibility yeah. for e everybody's part. Everybody's part has their own uh, uh, needs and responsibility to everyone else on the set. And that collaboration yeah. is what is so wonderful. You know, I mean, what are we all after? Connection. This is connection. This is a frequency we talk on. Uh, Star Trek for all of us. And we're connected now. Uh, and with the crew, it was exactly that. I remember one scene. I can't remember what show it was. But I was lying on a bed telling a long story. And at a certain line, the 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 camera was doing this long crawl toward me, and when they reached a certain point, I needed to cry, and something went wrong with the camera, and I cried, and they said, we gotta do it again. It was like, come on, Anna, come on, you could do it, you could do it, and it was like us together going, we've all got to make this moment happen, no matter how difficult it is, and that's a moment I don't forget, that collaboration. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, 
When you first premiered, Next Generation was still on the air and it was like at its apex. You were like Jan Brady to Marsha Brady, right? <laughs> um, so the, but then Next Generation ends and goes to the movies. Now Voyager comes along. Now they're Jan and you're Marsha. No. 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 They were Marsha. <laughs> we're Cindy. Yeah, people out there are like, what are <laughs> they talking <laughs> about? <laughs> we turned into Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> it's your butt. There was but, a great advantage yes. to that. Mm -hmm. No one was watching us. Mm. So, so you set and the house Ira, on fire. So Ira we set even, the house on fire. Yeah, Ira talks about how he was so happy for that stroke of luck because then he could write things and they really weren't paying as much attention. They being the producers, the studio. They would have stopped us. The eye of Sauron turned yeah. to them <laughs> that, yeah. that's how for a little bit. It. That's how it's Ira true. described it. That's true. Which right. is a, a great, you know, a great analogy. Um, Thanks. I want, you know, it's so funny. I have to say, we were talking to Richard Dreyfuss the other day, which is not nearly as exciting as talking to you. And um, he, he <laughs> I am lying. He's but, totally but, lying. Uh, he Stop. says, he says, he, he's talking about how much Robert Shaw hated the man in the glass, glass booth, which he wrote the movie adaptation. And all I could think, and I didn't say this to Dreyfuss, was duet is the best adaptation of the man in the glass booth. And what a fantastic episode that it is. Was. And how great you're in, uh, you are in that episode. How magnificent that, all these years later, it still stands up. It's like one of those towering achievements of the series. And you got to work with Harris Hewlin in that. I'd love to talk about some of him and some of the other great guest stars over the years that graced the stages, whether it be Brock Peters or um, Louise Fletcher. Frank Langella, Louise Fletcher. Um, what that was like, because you talk about being the Cindy, which makes Enterprise Cousin Oliver, but if you're the Cindy Brady... Um, oh, they definitely were. <laughs> my, my, my question to you is, you know, you still had all these great people who came to play with you. So you, you yeah. Were. yeah, but we didn't deserve to be Cindy. Cousin Oliver had its place. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not the actors, they're amazing. But the show was not as good. The Sorry. writing was so good. I think, it, I think the writing attracted some of these guest stars because it was just so rich. It was amazing. And, I, and all the actors you mentioned come to play. They actually like to act, not just to make a paycheck. So I think that they were attracted to the fact that it was so interesting. Well, because there was great writing, and that's you know, a testament to the amazing writing team, because you look at how successful Ron Moore has been since, and to a certain extent, Renee and Robert Hewitt Wolf, and uh, uh, you know, Ira, well, and Michael as well, were great coaches, and yeah. as we know, Michael was a huge baseball fan. So, um, and we talked about this last year, but I love this story, so I'm gonna break my rule of not asking the same questions. But let's talk about the baseball episode for you because you know we all thought, oh my God, you're so capable and so competent and so good at everything. And, and you must have loved the baseball episode, but. No, they, hi they had to hire a baseball player to, and I can't remember who it was, but they hired a pro baseball player to teach me how to throw a ball. This actually sounds like a Brady Bunch episode, I, I think. <laughs> How is it that Max was good at something, but you? I, I'm, you know, I'm athletic, but I could, I cannot, I have no, I can't tell when something's coming at me. Avery Brooks couldn't believe it. In one scene, he did a bit of an improv. We're all in a circle, and he throws me this uh, bag. It was a light bag uh, from, a, you know, from the other side of the circle. He throws it to me because we're about to go on our mission. It was like a cool thing to do. And he threw it at me, and I stood like this. <laughs> and it hit me in the face. <laughs> and he was like, what? I, it, don't you have any basic instinct to catch? And I really don't. So, so I had to learn how to do it. And it, and it was a big deal when I, when I hit the ball because the day wasn't going to end until I hit that ball and the whole crew was like, she's never going to do it. <laughs> she is never going to hit it. And I hit it first off because I had been practicing with the baseball player for like three weeks. And I hit it. The first time we filmed, they practically carried me on their shoulders. They were so thrilled. So if you got Pete Rose to sign a baseball, you know, Nana not, not, not can also sign uh, baseballs for you if you That's want. That's right. Um, Terry, I want to ask you, it really felt there was some reluctance among 
some of the writers, they felt, oh, when Michael joined the show, it meant we weren't good enough. We needed help, you know. But it seems like you became real partners in crime and that you had somebody to confide in and work with and that it, it gave your character, you know, a, a chance to sort of, like somebody both behind the scenes and on stage that was a, a partner, had been through what you had been through. Can, can you talk a little bit about what, was that transformative, that fourth season for you? Did you, did you feel that it, it helped your character, helped you as a, you know, on stage to have Michael there? I think it helped me because Michael was my friend before um, he came to work on the show because we had Marina in common. The three of us were buddies. And um, so the first scene we had together, actually, Nana and I come out of the hollow suite dressed from Camelot times. But Michael and I, he's like, hey, if we flirt with each other, it's not written that way, but if we flirt with each other, maybe they'll write more stuff for us so that we can hang out together. <laughs> How did that work out? <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> yeah, so that pretty much worked out. And yeah. it's so funny because he was very outspoken how much he hated being paired with Troy in Next Generation. But well, did he say he hated working with me? No, he loved working with you. You see? This is what I'm saying. Well, we had reasonable arguments, meaning like we'd worked it out. Like, uh, I... I don't know why I just said like, like three times, four or five. Anyway, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. This is what would happen when I would do a scene with Michael. Tell me if your experience was different. We'd come in, we'd rehearse, we'd go back to our trailers for touch-ups, to change our clothes while they're lighting. We come back in, the lighting's done, we're ready to film, and we start to do the scene and then, uh, Michael, yes, Michael. I, I was just thinking there's this, there's this problem I'm having with the scene. No, not now. We're ready to film it, right? See? See? And it really, ah, oh, not Michael Dorn. Wow. And it, he would be like, but I'm making a good point. Call Michael Pillar last night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh. So then it would become, if it was just the two of us, I'd be, well, I'd be reasonably upset with him because it might change some wording I have. And it was like all of the techno babble I'd had. That's all my memory capacity I had for the day. <laughs> I didn't have any more left over for, yeah, let's rewrite that scene. That'll be fun. Let's try that. So, <laughs> but so then we talk it out, the two of us. And I think it was really an important relationship for me, Terry, just in general in life, to work with somebody where we could disagree and have a conversation and come to an understanding and maybe not like each other that day, but professionally get through it okay. And I think that really made us have a really great friendship. And I think that translated on, we never had a romantic, we had a romance of sort, but it was never, uh, a realized romance off set. And I think in a way that was really good because it was like, then we could always play that tension because it was just there. We just never did anything about it. Yeah, and it gave you a chance to play real human relationships because as you've talked about, it's so hard to memorize that techno babble because there's nothing you can relate to in your real life or in real science. So they just give you all this gobbledygook that you know, and, and people forget, it's not like you're getting these tricks a week earlier. Sometimes right. you're getting the rewrite the night before. And yeah. you're expected to know these lines, you know, perfectly when you show up on stage the next day. And that's not easy. Yeah, and that was with meaning in them, when you don't really know what it is saying. Yeah, and, and it, it doesn't really say anything at all. Right, right exactly. But, you know, you try to do um, as much substitution as possible. Right, for what things might be, whether it's a car or not. But it's still an alien name that, it, you know it's an alien, but what was that word again? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The Kobliads? You know? The, <laughs> not the turbo. Stem bolts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Stem bolts. The thruster shields are down, or whatever they are. You know the stem bolts, this is Bob and Elaine. <laughs> exactly. Friends with the Underhills. It was like a Jay Leno thing. And everybody, oh, is that a kind of cheese? Is it a wine? No, it actually means. Right. 
But and I remember seeing the point in, because I recently watched it, that, that they really gave you things to play instead of just saying, oh, you're wise, that you, through your life, gathered all these things that you were curious about and interested in and good at, and that you had, you know, rough and tumble friends that you'd go off on, you know, Klingons that you knew. And that really made, I think, everyone understand Jadzia so much better yeah. that you did things instead of just were talked about. And isn't that always more interesting always. though? Because it's a, it's a visual medium. So if you're not showing the audience who the characters are and you're just constantly you, doing- Telling. Yeah, what yeah. is it called? Expo exposition. exposition. Yeah. Well, it's like- sort of, uh, Hearsay uh, drama. Oh that, gosh, it it's like so that. boring. That episode, Blood Oath, felt like the demarcation point for Jadzia, where that character went from, she's the science officer, and she's, I guess, old, and she knows Cisco, to, oh, wow. It's like suddenly it goes from she has things she talks about to she has a history, and she has these relationships that we never thought about, and she has these capabilities that we never saw but make perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I'm excited because I'm rewatching it with the uh, I Delta. Was just ask you about Were you? That, yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you both about that because the audience and us have a certain perspective on you and your characters in the show, and we love it that you will never be able to quite understand, right? <laughs> so, because you were there, and you were there till you know working Fridays, and you know it's a whole different journey. Did you just say Fridays? Yeah. I love that. So, I've never heard that. Really? Okay. Well, so my question is, you're rewatching it now. <laughs> For um, the Delta Flyers, you rewatched it while you were doing research for your book. What surprised you, or what are your takeaways from? I assume you weren't sitting at home watching it for years. Now, like after all these years, yeah. to go <laughs> with a nose half off my you know, that's me. There. Right that's there. me. I mean, Norma Desmond, you just watch it all day. Right. Right. Or um, Jim Carrey, it's on a loop. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like going back and watching? Like, sort of, what's your perspective on seeing the show again for, this, for both of you? My perspective is that it, it, it we did it too soon. It's it's really it was ahead of its time, and we are a space station that we need to stay on for a certain amount of time and figure it out all out between us, all the diverse, strange, different people and so it just seems very um timeless uh the show and i'm kind of amazed when i look at when i looked at the 90s and what women were the the place women were in uh it, it's amazing what we were given license to do um and i do put a lot of that on iris stephen bear yeah. And the fact that no one was was poking him and saying you can't do that, uh, that we had such a big playing field and such a range of things that that two women could do, and, and not just us, the other women. I mean, you know, there was Cassidy Yates, unbelievable character. You know, she's captain, and she tells uh, Cisco, mm, no, not so fast. Wait a minute, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Uh, and we'll have a relationship. It's just the women were, had really interesting, good lives. And what was your reaction as you watch it for Delta Flyers? You're still in the first season, I imagine, though. Uh, Delta Flyers, Journey Through the Wormhole, Patreon. Please, everyone, sign up because I'll be lonely without you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just started. I just saw the pilot and the first two episodes, uh, Man Alone, I think Man Alone, and Past Prologue. I think it actually was Past Prologue and then Man Alone. Um, so this is way more new for me to be watching it back. I'm really enjoying it though. And I, it, I'm watching it, that it's so fun to watch it with fresh eyes, isn't it? Mm. Because it's such a long time ago to see myself, it's, I have so much compassion for that young woman, you know, starting this job at 28 and not really knowing what was happening. And, and, and I was just telling Nana, watching it through the lens of knowing what, the, what was happening to me, Terry, as I'm watching that I'm having compassion for myself and for the other actors and just seeing how the makeup evolves. 
So because it's the very beginning of it for me, it's, it's, it's not fully baked for me yet. I don't, I, it's just, it, I'm really excited that I get to take it one step at a time without the pressure of, oh, I hope I'm good this week. What did I like about this week? What didn't I like about this week? What can I do better? I'm just, I'm just watching it. You get it. to enjoy the show. I get to enjoy the show. That's so nice. Isn't that nice? And I want to add, because you've said this in the past, so this is where I've gotten this to. If it weren't for Laura Bear mm -hmm. saying, uh-uh-uh, to Ira Stephen Bear several times, mm -hmm. you know, so Laura had been a great big cheerleader for both of our characters and for women in general and educating her husband on... <laughs> this would be a better idea. So, I mean, she is a powerful woman in that respect, for really sure. Really powerful. Yeah, she didn't write the scenes. Right, sure. But she Astrophysicist was... and ballerina. That's quite a combination. Woo! Wow, it sounds like a sitcom. Yeah. That's great. And she's gorgeous. <laughs> and she puts up with Ira, so kudos well, to her. That's, that's almost unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to do some questions, right? I mean, we only... We oh, look at them run. Go, nobody's wow. excited the about best. that. Aww. Oh, man. Okay, everybody line up and try and, because we totally blew this. We don't have as much time as we would like for questions. So let's make, try and make them quick and to the point if possible. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie and I'm a meteorologist. And I was wondering, what's the worst weather you've had to deal with on set or in real life? Because <laughs> I always get blamed for it and I love hearing people's stories. <laughs> I love weather. I love weather. I don't care what it is. And I grew up with tornadoes in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I'm trying to talk as fast as possible. Love a snowstorm. I love preparing. I am the pantry person. Ask my son. He's like, how does one person need all this food? You never know. <laughs> love weather. Uh, I lived in uh, the tip of Manhattan when the hurricane hit. And it looked like a disaster movie, looking out of the building. It was like looking out of the building, not looking out of the building, looking out of the building, not looking out of the building. And uh, it, we lost power for 10 days, and it felt like uh, we, were, we were in a disaster movie. And then we'd take the you know, subway uptown, and it was like normal life. It was hard to believe. But yeah, that was the worst weather I've ever been through. And I'll never forget my son and his friend were staying in the apartment with us because uh, the friend couldn't leave. And uh, they were both playing some game on the computer. And I was, look out the window. This is historic. And I was like, yeah, anyway. It just <laughs> didn't matter. It was probably better. Well, thank you. And if you ever want to chase tornadoes, my sidekick seat is open. Very cool. Oh, cool. My stepdad, not the one that is my favorite one that has been my dad for most of my natural life, used to take me and my sister, carry us under his arms so we go chase tornadoes. Very. On foot. Wow. Really crazy. scary. <laughs> With Bill Paxton. Come back. Uh, hi, I'm Caden. Uh, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm inspired by you. Um, but uh, uh, if you could go back and just talk to yourself when you, you were just put on, like just hired and just put on the job. What would you, what advice would you give? What would you say? I would say feel compassion for yourself. Allow yourself the room to fail and to learn. And if that doesn't work, so be it. But don't accommodate to the point where you start beating yourself up like other people around you might. I would say trust yourself. Trust yourself, 100%. You know what you're doing. Don't listen to all the other voices, you're fine. <laughs> My name is Amanda, um, and I want to know, Nana, in, in light of what you were sharing about the first time you were reading Kira's voice and attitude and aspect, your, both of your characters changed the way that women were portrayed on TV and the way that we see ourselves and how we view the world, right? When did you first know that Jadzia and Kira were going to be incendiary in terms of just like these trailblazers for the ways that women could show up and be smart and brilliant and badass and just awesome. Well, for me, that didn't happen for many years. 
probably decades because at the time my character wasn't accepted and it was like, oh, too much. Oh, too much. You're going too far. And I just kind of hunkered down and did it anyway because it was such an opportunity to be the kind of woman I wanted to be in my own life. And, um, I, and it was really in writing the book and talking to the people that were inspired that I realized what a cultural effect uh, just, just the opportunity gave. And here's the thing. What's really incredible, at, there were young girls and women and other people out there too who saw us, didn't have support around them, and found virtual mentors in a TV show. If that's not indomitable human spirit, I don't know what is. That's what's impressive. Hi, I'm Mike, and I, I asked Terry a little bit about this at the table earlier, but I want to expand it some, and it kind of tacks on to the last question. In, in like the YouTube world right now, from like the queer spaces, the feminist spaces, the marginalized community spaces, people are doing these character deep dives of, you know, trans experience, being a strong woman in a, in a strong masculine culture of being queer, you know, Dr. Bashir's relationships that people have compared Dax to being trans experience, things like that. When you were making Deep Space Nine, how much, if any, awareness did you have of how powerful that was going to be or how much that was actually what you were portraying? I think you did. This one? Yeah. Um, I, to piggyback on the first, I don't want, because I know I can see how little time we have. Um, I think from reading it the first time, I thought that my character, definitely because of how my character was written and the description of my character that I had, that I couldn't see what was going to happen for sure. But I had some idea of knowing that I was, because I had lived seven lifetimes, that it was going to be really fucking interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that um, it was going to be, a, I loved Star Trek, the original series, and I loved that it was groundbreaking. I loved that it was, you know, the, the first interracial kiss, so that when I got to be married to a man of color, when I got to have a same-sex relationship, and even though I don't think um, trans is the right description of Dax, I love being the poster child because anybody who feels disenfranchised, and I know Nana feels the same way, we are honored to stand up and be there for you because nobody should feel othered. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Hi. Stop it. Hi. That's Rebecca. <laughs> How you doing? So, um, Spotify rap is like a thing right now. So what do you, what is your like most listened to song this year, you think? Ooh, most listened to song? I thought you'd say most listened to podcast, but okay. Or that's <laughs> too. Most listened to song? Yeah. Um, I, I. Purple Hat by Sophie Tucker. I, I, <laughs> weirdly, that's something that if I just have to get myself back up, listen to Purple Hat. Wow. Okay. Weirdly, I don't know. Maybe this isn't weird. Maybe I'll get it. Um, it my divorce wasn't that far away ago, and uh, Empty Nester, it's second year, so... I have to be honest, a lot of music for me has been too sensitive and triggering. So I will most likely listen to uh, anything that has to do with a symphony. I don't even need to, or, you know, spa music. And I know it's not very interesting, but uh, it really is an emotional trigger for me to listen to songs and, and being 60 years old and, and being alone it can sometimes be too depressing to hear things that used to make me really excited. So I will come back to music, but for right now I listen to things without uh, an opinion. 
Wow, a music conversation with no Taylor Swift. This might be a first. Um, Liz? Hi. Um, so somebody who was raised by their grandparents and had a lot of time to watch me TV, who grew up loving Matlock, the Andy Griffith show, all of Andy's work. Got any fun stories about him? About Andy? About Andy. Um, um, not really. I don't have any, I don't have any stories about Andy. And, but, I, but I, too, grew up loving him. Yeah. Very cool. Great actor. <laughs> Thank you. And if you haven't seen Face in the Crowd with Andy Griffith, that is his best film. You have to see it. Brilliant. I brought the baby back for Terry. Stop. <laughs> I don't have time to come back and grab her. She's only 10 weeks old. Um, I love you guys so much. You're amazing. First TV crushes. I can admit it. Um, but... What was it like doing Far Beyond the Stars and the scene with Avery just absolutely losing it? You know, he, Avery had a saying when something was, when you just kind of transcended the scene and it just went and everyone goes into a flow state and he called it God showing up. He said, well, God showed up in that. And for Avery in that scene, it was like God showed up. It, he, he went to a place that was, you know, you go, uh, you don't want to move because you don't want to break anything. But it's very, very powerful to be in the room with that kind of emotion. And it was upsetting and, and disturbing and also, you know, uh, humbling as an actor to watch another actor go there and be that. So it, it, was, it, was, a, it was a complicated place to be. Yeah. Well, Thank I, you. I wish we had another hour. We don't, unfortunately. But you guys are going to be at your booth. You're going to be signing, I'm sure, answering questions. But before we do that, as is the tradition at GalaxyCon, they're going to take a giant group selfie. So come take your selfie with them. And then stay for Walter Koenig. And then go see them at their booth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. That was wonderful. <laughs>